Hello, everybody. Um, thank you again for joining us uh, for our webinar today. My name is Stacey Matrazo. I'm the Executive Director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, thank you uh, again for coming today. We have a great um, presentation on Florida monarchs and milkweed. Um, for those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat. A little bit of technical difficulties here, as always. <laughs> there we go. Um, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through our education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Um, our work is made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. This is our um, old design. This is our newish design. If you have the old or the new license plate, um, you are supporting our work and we thank you very much for that. Um, you are also entitled to membership benefits with your license plate. Um, so please let us know if you have it and we'll get you set up in our database. Um, funds from the license plate, along with donations, memberships, um, grants, and other funding allow us to do programs like what you're seeing today, as well as planting projects around the state of Florida, um, education and outreach on the importance of native wildflowers, research in the area as well, and so much for so much more. <laughs> We'd like to thank those of you who find our programs valuable to um, consider becoming a member, getting the license plate, or making a donation. Be sure to um, check out our website for uh, information on how to do that, as well as to find out more about the programs that we offer. We have um, some great webinars and field trips coming up. Be sure to check our website for that as well. Um, next month, we will be joined by George Gann and Kara Abbott of the Institute for Regional Conservation. They will be presenting uh, Natives for Your Neighborhood, Transforming Native Plant Gardening into Habitat Restoration on Wednesday, July 19th. And um, we've also got some great field trips coming up too on July 22nd. Our own Emily Bell will be um, taking us on an evening walk through Cary State Forest um, along the power line right away where um, we have a really great Wildflower hotspot. We hope to see some crested fringed orchids, some Kate's bees lilies, uh, Barbara's buttons, and um, so much more. And um, yeah, be sure to follow us on social media or um, sign up for our newsletter to keep uh, abreast of all of our upcoming opportunities. Um, I just have a couple of housekeeping um, things to go over before we get started. All attendees are muted with cameras off. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to uh, enter your questions. Yes, the chat is um, active, but we will not be monitoring that for questions. We ask that you please use the Q&A to ask your questions. We will address questions at the end of the presentation um, as time permits. Um, the webinar is being recorded. You can, uh, you'll be able to find it on our website as well as on our YouTube channel um, in about 24 to 48 hours. We'll also be sending out um, an email to everyone who has registered for this event um, to send you a link to the recording as well as some helpful resources around today's program. And now I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, we are really happy to have Lily Anderson Messick here with us today. She is a botanist, a naturalist, and a third generation Floridian who lives in the Florida Panhandle. She began working for the Florida Native Plant Society in 2019 as their director of North Florida programs, and uh, she also runs their Toria Keepers project. We are so excited to have her here with us today to talk about milkweed, and some of the challenges that this beloved and um, very critical species um, is, is dealing with. So without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to you, Lily. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here and get this started. All right. Can everybody see that? Great. Yes. Sorry. You're good. Okay. All right, so Florida monarchs and milkweeds, you know, um, 
without the monarchs, the milkweeds would not be getting so much attention. So we have to mention them. And so the monarch butterfly, as many of you know, is in a drastic decline. And 85% uh, of the population has declined in the, the last two decades. And the Western population that migrates on the West Coast in California has suffered a 99% decline. So that's a major issue that would deserve, you know, federally endangered status, you would think. Um, and the species was petitioned for federal endangered, for being listed as federally endangered in 2014. And in 2020, the federal government finally got back and said that it is warranted, but not, but precluded. So basically what they're saying is that it deserves federally endangered status, but protecting it would be too much work. And so there are no protections in place currently. And so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has kind of tried other ways of, of um, you know, helping aiding this species without um, uh, federal endangered uh, listing protections. And that involves asking individuals, homeowners, citizens to plant native milkweed in their yard. So we are in a really amazing hot spot of biodiversity for milkweeds. So milkweeds are in the Asclepius genus, and this is a map of the biodiversity with the bluer regions having more diversity of species. And you can see the panhandle here in Florida especially is very biodiverse with Asclepius. So what are milkweeds? Milkweeds are in the family of Pocinaceae, that's the dog bane family. And they're in the genus Asclepius. And so plants that are in that genus, we commonly call milkweed. There are about 140 species worldwide of Asclepius on, on all the continents, pretty much except for probably the poles. And there are 73 species in the US. And in Florida, we have 21. So out of 73 species, we have 21. That's a pretty large percentage of species diversity represented here in Florida. And we have two endemic species that are endemic specifically to peninsular Florida. So a little bit about milkweed flowers. So one of the key things in identifying milkweeds because they come in all shapes and sizes is their flower structure. They have a, a flower structure. Oh my gosh, sorry. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can do this again. Okay, <laughs> it happens, I guess. Okay, back to the flower structure of milkweeds. So the flower structure is one of the ways that we identify it because it is uniform across the different species. They can have all different shapes and sizes of leaves and even kind of shapes and sizes of flowers, but the structure is the same. And so they have these things that are called hoods and those are the large part that you see at the top of the flower that are usually facing up like a crown and the hoods form what's called a corolla uh or sorry the the corolla is actually reflexed the hoods um inside the hoods are what's called a horn and that inside that hood is where the nectar pulls up. And so when visiting pollinators stop at a flower, which lots of them do, they will be sipping from the nectar that is pulled up in those hoods. But the hoods come in all different shapes and sizes. And um, the hoods make up the corona and the corolla are the reflexed petals beneath the hoods. So typically in most milkweed flowers, they are reflexed, which means they face down and kind of kind of like a skirt. But in some species like Asclepius viridae here, number one on there, um, they face up. So this structure though is pretty uniform and they have a very specific um, way of fertiliz of being fertilized. So in, rather than having individual pollen grains, which most of our flowering plants have little grains of pollen of varying sizes, milkweeds like orchids have what are called pollinia. And these are packets, sticky packets of pollen. And they come in specific little shapes. And they, they look a lot like um, if you've ever seen a uh, a maple in fruit with its little samaras, 
they um, look kind of like that, like a Samara. Here's a photo of one on the left. So the pollinia um, is what we refer to as the packets of pollen are the pollinia. And there are two, just like the little maple Samara, there are two wings. And when a visiting insect stops to sip on the nectar of these milkweed flowers, they often will catch the top of that pollinia. It's made to be out a little bit so that when they are stopping, their legs might accidentally slip in there, catch the top of it and pull it out. And in order for it to be fertilized, to fertilize another flower, uh, the insect would have to visit another flower and usually another flower on a different plant for it to be successfully fertilized. And it would have to accidentally slide the plinia into the stigmatic slit that you see here, right beneath where the original plinia was. So here is a photo of a bee on Asclepias tomentosa. And if you look inside that circle, you can see the a tiny little plinia attached to its legs. And so often if you look closer, some, sometimes if you don't see it when you're in the field, but looking back at your photos when you get home, you can see the little plinia stuck to some of the insects. Okay, here's, here's another issue with the fertilization is Sometimes some insects are not, once their legs get caught on the pollinia, they're not strong enough to pull their legs out to actually remove the pollinia. And so sometimes you'll see an insect hanging dead from a milkweed flower because it got caught in there and couldn't get away. And then over on the right, you see the bee, but just to the right of the bee, there's an insect leg hanging from this milkweed flower. And that's something that you see, you know, not uncommonly on milkweed flowers. An insect, in order to save itself, will just pull its leg right off in order to get away. And so one fact I didn't mention about the pollinia, um, milkweeds rarely hybridize between different species. And that's because each of the species have specific shapes of their pollinia that fit into the, their specific stigmatic slits, kind of like a key in a lock. So it's very unlikely that even if an insect is visiting multiple milkweed species and have multiple pollinia on them and might try to slide one in, on a different species, it's very uncommon that it actually successfully fits and is fertile, will fertilize a flower. Okay, so now we are going to start the journey through our 21 species of native milkweed. And this um, talk is kind of focusing more on growing native milkweed at home and which species are best suited for that. And so I'm starting at the beginning with species that are the least best suited for that, which we'll go over why. But this is one of our first species. And this is Curtis's milkweed Asclepias curtisii. As you can see, there's a box in the right hand corner here. And those, you see all the counties in Florida, the counties that are highlighted in green are the counties that this plant is known to be present and occur in. And so we'll have that map in all of these. Uh, slides that I go through. So this is an endemic species to Florida. This here on the left is me seeing it for the first time. I was so excited when I got to finally see it. Um, it only occurs in very, uh, in very dry scrub. So this species occurs in very deep sand. It has a um, it has a very specific habitat. And so that's one of the reasons why it is less uh, likely to be a suitable, you know, candidate for your yard or garden, unless you have very deep sand. And also because of its rarity, uh, it's less likely to be able to be found in production, like in cultivation. But it is a stunning species. Here, at, here you'll see some of the genetic variation within it. And I'll show you in all the species we go over. I love to see the genetic variation, the different leaf shapes, and flower shapes and leaf colors and flower colors that you see in these species. And here's our other, so we only have two endemic species in Florida and that endemic means that they only occur in this one region. And that means endemic to Florida means only occurs in Florida. And both of our endemic species are endemic to peninsular Florida. Um, this is Asclepias fei, the Florida milkweed, or as my friend Kara Driscoll, who is pictured in the left-hand corner in the background, she refers to it as fairy milkweed. She has done a lot of work and research on this species, and um, she took me to see it for the first time. Oh, and this is um, 
Kara is also an artist and she did the artwork for our t-shirts for um, at our FNPS conference this year. So Asclepius fei again, is not a real great suit or suitable candidate for home growing, especially if you're planting milkweed in order to feed monarchs, because as you can see, it is very small. There is a paltry amount of leaf matter to feed monarchs. It's also extremely rare, and it has a very specific uh, habitat requirements, deep scrub and sand. So not the best candidate, and it also is just almost impossible to find in cultivation. Um, there's a photo on the right. This um, this specimen was taken with the correct permits uh, for an herbarium specimen, but I was really excited to, to get to see what the root system looked like on the species. And you can see all of our species that occur in these sandy habitats have uh, these thickened tuberous roots that store energy and water um, underground in order for them to survive the fire that often comes through disturbance and also drought. And this is one of the milkweeds that I get to see up here in the panhandle and um, it is almost endemic to Florida, but it occurs just um, in Alabama as well just one county in Alabama. It, this is a very rare species, though. It's a G2 critically imperiled species and state-listed threatened Asclepius virigula, southern milkweed. It's a really beautiful milkweed, but again, although it occurs in more wet, it occurs in these wet prairies and savannas in um, the north Florida, but although it could possibly do well in cultivation and in yards because it is so rare. It is uncommon to find in cult. I, I've never seen it be offered for sale. And it also is um, very kind of paltry in size and not going to offer very much food for monarchs if you're trying to raise monarchs. Here are just a few more beauty shots. And so it co-occurs in these wet prairies with carnivorous plants like Saracenia flava that you see in the background there. And then we have Carolina milkweed, Asclepia cinerea. This is also known as ash milkweed. It occurs in North Florida and in the Southeastern coastal plain. It off, it's usually in wet flatwoods, pine flatwoods. And it has this really beautiful kind of grayish purple lavender color that my friend Nicole refers to as unicorn color. Um, and it's another very small diminutive species with almost no leaves. It's likely to be more likely to be in cultivation, but because it doesn't have much leaf matter, it's not the best candidate for that. But I think it is one that could be grown um, in a typical garden. Really beautiful. Then we have savanna milkweed, Asclepius pedicillata. This is definitely an outlier as, as far as like shape and form. It has, rather than its corolla being reflexed, it has the upward reflex or upward facing corolla that hugs the um, hood and gynesthesium in the middle there. And so it has this very strange kind of like tubular look and it's green. It's like this bright yellow green, the flowers are. So it's pretty easily overlooked. It's also very short and diminutive, usually um, no more than 10 inches tall. And so you, I often really only notice it post prescribed burns, like after a fire has come through the landscape. And actually the last two species that we went over, Asclepius virigula and Asclepius cinerea, those also are very fire dependent. A lot of these species that occur in wet prairies, wet savannas, and wet flatwoods, um, they only bloom prolifically after a fire. So especially with Asclepius virigula, you know, I can go back to the known points that I have for those plants every year. And if the area wasn't burned, I'm almost guaranteed to not find any plants in bloom, even though it's the right time of year and I know exactly where it is. They all, they, I've seen them bloom occasionally outside of a prescribed burn year, but almost never. And after a burn year, you see lots of them. And that's the case with Asclepius cinerea and Asclepius pedicillata here. And then we have green comet milkweed, which is very rare in Florida, but it's more common further north. 
And in Florida here, it's only in two counties, it's state listed endangered. Um, as you can see, the range, um, the green, the dark green are the states that it occurs in, and the light green are the, state, the counties within the states that it is vouchered in. Um, and so this is another one that has a really unusual form. You can see where the common name green comet milkweed comes from, Asclepius viridiflora. And it has extremely reflexed corolla and very abbreviated hoods. Those hoods that are usually what pool up with nectar are, are tucked in below the gynesthesium, that centerpiece of the flower, and almost non-existent. It's a really interesting flower. It occurs in Florida pretty much only on limestone glades, and those only occur in Jackson and Gadsden County in Florida, and so th those are the only counties you find this plant in. So again, because of it ha of its very particular habitat, it's less likely to be available for cultivation, although it's possible that it could be more adaptable in like more average garden soils. And some people have, you know, alkaline soils in their yard. Then we have Michaud's milkweed, Asclepius Michaudii. This is another one that is very common in wet flatwoods, pine flatwoods, savannas even. Um, and it's a low growing recumbent species that kind of lays prostrate on the ground. And, and then it's um, stalk kind of leans up and blooms. And it's another one that's very dependent on fire returns for um, prolific blooming. It might bloom a little bit out of years, outside of years that are burn years, but it, you really see the majority of them flowering in a post-burn season. So you can see here how it kind of lays on the ground and then leans up and blooms. And it varies from this Pink, beautiful pinkish color to a light pale white to white to green. And it has, you know, a good amount of leaf matter on there, but not a whole lot. It would be a plant that I think could be adaptable to our yards and gardens. Okay, the Sandhill milkweed, Asclepius humistrata. This is probably our like most well known of our native species because it is so unique in shape and form. And it's just stun. It's a stunning species. It also is a, a conservation priority species because it's really critical to the mo the migration of our eastern population of monarchs. So monarchs, as you know, they come down. They are a tropical butterfly that has adapted to expand its range by seasonally come going north to follow their food source, milkweed, and then going back down south to Mexico to overwinter because they can't withstand freezes. So in its my northerly migration in early spring, this is the first milkweed species that is up. And this species that the entire Eastern population is very dependent on this species of milkweed because it's what they feed on first. So this is an ex a sandhill species. So again, the sandhill species tend to have those big storage tap roots, and they also tend to be much slower growing, especially in the drier sandhill, scrubby sandhills. They tend to be a whole lot slower growing. And this plant that you're looking at here, this could be, we have no way of aging it, but in my experience, this definitely could be, you know, over 50 years maybe even a hundred years old. I ha we have no idea how long these plants live, but they probably live for a very long time because even if the tops are hacked back or killed back in some way, the, the, the tuberous root system, which goes down very deep into the soil, often survives and re-sprouts. So this species is unique, not, not just in its form, but also in its chemistry. It has the highest level of cardiac glycosides. And cardiac glycosides are what make milkweeds toxic to other herbivores. So other, um, other insects that might want to eat leafy plant matter can't eat, they're not adapted to eat it because cardiac glycosides are toxic to them. They're also actually toxic to mammals as well, like humans. They can actually um, stop your heart, cause arrhythmia. Uh, but monarchs, 
through this, you know, evolutionary arms race have evolved to be adapted to eat milkweed to to withstand the amount of cardiac glycosides in the leaves. And in turn, they store those cardiac glycosides in their body, and that makes them toxic to their predators. So birds and other things that might want to eat the, the uh, big, juicy monarch caterpillars don't because they know they contain cardiac glycosides. But our milkweed species don't have a standardized amount of this toxin in them. This chemical really occurs in different levels in different species and can even adjust according to a changes in the environment like heat and other things. But in general, this species has the highest amount of those toxins. And so even the native monarchs that are adapted to withstand and ingest the, these cardiac glycosides can still die on these plants by ingesting too much. And so one of the adaptations to that, I think I have a photo of that. Well, I don't, but they'll they'll take, and you might have seen this happen on other milkweed species, the, ins, the uh, caterpillars would take a bite out of the main vein of those leaves, and that kind of let some of this latex that you see in here leak out so there's less of the cardiac glycosides in the leaf and then they'll eat the leaf once the late some of the latex has leafed out. So it's a really interesting adaptation. One thing I wanted to mention was that this photo was taken um, on April 4th on the roadside. And so that is way before any other milkweed species would be up and around. So here are just a few more beauty shots of this beautiful species. It's another um, prostrate species, which means it lays on the ground and flowers kind of with its stem laying on the ground. And it's very variable in leaf. Like some of the leaves are very green and some are very purple. And gosh, the leaf, that veination in the leaves is just really incredible and stunning. Look at this, this is a beautiful photo. And you get a little bit closer and you see this little bee beetle jumping onto the flower. And so this is these plants are also important nectar sources for insects in early spring as well. Just a few more beautiful photos. The flowers start off whitish pink. Um, the hoods are almost always white. And then the hoods turn that yellowy color as the flower itself ages and begins to wither. So this is a very sought after species for growing in home gardens because a lot of people are learning how important it is for the monarch population and also because it's just a really beautiful species. But it's very difficult to grow in pots. A lot of these species that are in that occur in dry sand hills that have very long tap roots uh, do not like being grown in pots. Um, you can see here on the left these very long pots, and you see the tiny little amount of leaf matter at the top of those pots. The roots are already filling up those pots, but there's only, you know, a few centimeters of, of actual leaves above the surface. So these species establish a deep root system before they have almost any leaves. They, in, they have a few leaves to catch sunlight, but they put all the... the many first years of their life into investing in a deep root system and then they start to put on leaves and grow but they're very slow growing um, they're very slow to flower and bloom um, and they can be really they have been proven to be very tricky to grow on a large scale so it's not as adaptable to and it's also not as adaptable to he heavy soils and rich organic matter so you can see here how long these root systems are. They can go, you know, three to four feet straight down. We were digging these from a roadside population with the correct permits as part of a um, rescue effort because this road was being widened. And so we dug these plants to relocate them at a recipient site. And it's a lot of work. And so um, if you try to plant this plant in, you know, I have kind of slightly clay loamy soils in my yard. Um, if I tried to plant one, it would just slowly die. And I've tried growing them from seed. It's 
I would suggest if someone really wants to try this plant and they have good deep sand to grow it in, I would suggest growing it from seed uh, because it, it's just tricky to find it, one, and it, two, to grow it in a pot and transplant it well successfully. So um, planting from seed is probably the best option, but you really have to have the right habitat. Um, and I've tried planting them from seed in my yard. They grow, they come up, and then they just end up dying because they really require pretty deep sand. Okay, velvet leaf milkweed Asclepius tomentosa. This is another beautiful species that this one is really interesting because the leaves to me look a lot like an oak sapling, um, but they have a very unique flower. And here on the left, you see this bee on here. Um, once you start photographing and becoming interested in native wildflowers, as many of you know, you end up learning about native insects as well, because the relationship between the two is so deep. They're so deeply connected. And I learned about this bee because um, I posted the, a photo of a milkweed with one of these bees on it online, and an entomologist reached out to me and said that this is a federally endangered species. This is the Bombus fraternus, uh, the South Southern Plains bumblebee is the common name, and it's a bee that I often see on milkweeds, and I don't know that I've ever seen it on any other species really in um, Florida, so it's good and important to pay attention to the insects as well because they might be rare and endangered too. But these flowers have a really unique form and the arrangement of the inflorescences on the stem or the flower clusters on the stem are, are really beautiful. And you can see some of the variation in color on the, the corolla on the ones on the right have that deep burgundy color. Oh, and I would say again that this is another sandhill species that has deep tap roots. It, I have seen this species available in cultivation, but it's um, not, as hard, not as easy to get a hold of. But I do think it's a little bit more adaptable than the Asclepius humistrata is to less sandy soils, but it still needs mostly sandy soils. Okay, purple savanna milkweed. The common name for this one is, is typically red milkweed, but it's not red. It's never red. So unfortunately, it got that name. Um, but uh, Al Alan Weekly, with the flora of the, who wrote the flora of southeastern United States, is calling it purple savanna milkweed now. So I'm trying to switch over to that name. And this species only occurs in the extreme western panhandle counties. And it only occurs in those counties in these seepage slopes and bogs. And so they're very, they're extremely wet. And it's a really beautiful species. It has these very sharply pointed uh, upturned hoods. That's one of the ways that I differentiate it from Asclepius incarnata, which is more common in cultivation and more, um, you see it more often in plantings and in gardens. This species is, is very uncommon in cultivation. I don't know that I've ever seen it available for sale, but I do think it could be adaptable to yards, but I've, I have never grown it, so I'm not sure. And as you can see here, these are both Asclepius rubra but they have very different leaves. Um, and there is some talk now about whether these different leaf forms are uh, caused by hybridization with Asclepius lanceolata, another species that we'll go over soon, or whether these are two separate species that are co-occurring. And But for now, we're calling them all Asclepius rubra. And longleaf milkweed, Asclepius longifolia. This is a species that I think has a really great, um, I think it's a really great opportunity to grow in home gardens, but I haven't seen it very available in nurseries and gardens yet. We'll talk all about that um, later in the um, presentation about where to find these plants. But this one, it's not very tall, it's fairly low growing, but it produces a lot of leaves. The leaves are not very large, but it produces a lot of them. And it has these really beautiful flowers, which are some of the most photogenic, I think, in my um, mind. And they typically occur in um, wet prairies, wet flatwoods, 
uh, wet pine savannas. Here's a picture of me with one so you can get a scale of it and you can see where its name comes from longifolia. It means long leaves. And on the right there is a really beautiful, this a beautiful photo of one. And you can see the hoods on this species are extremely abbreviated and the gynesthesium, that structure in the middle that the plinia are in is much higher up above the hoods. But it still has that same milkweed structure. A few more photos. And I, when I took the photo on the right, I didn't even notice, but there's a tiny little mantis on the flower there. Such a lovely species. I love this one. This is another stunner. Green antelope horn, Asclepius viridi. And this is um, a really un a pretty uncommon species in Florida where you do find populations. They're usually, a, you know, a few populations in the area, but it's very disjunct and separated, as you can see in the range map here on the right. The three populations in Florida do not connect. Um, in North Florida here, we see it in li on limestone glades. And as you can see, the two other areas of Florida where you um, would find it are also regions where there's a lot of limestone at the soil surface. And this is a very robust and large species. Those flowers are large for a milkweed. They're about this big. Um, and the plants can get fairly large in the right conditions as well. And they have big leaves also. So this is a, another really great plant that could be a good, really beautiful and great choice for growing in your yard and for supporting monarch caterpillars as well. But it's slow growing and it's not very available yet. Um, but it is really lovely with those green. See, this is one of the ones that have the corollas that are facing upwards. That little skirt that usually faces down is going upwards. And the hoods on this one are this beautiful purple color. And here is the comic, comically large, large flower milkweed, Asclepius conovens. The, those structures in the front, those are the hoods. They're just so massive in this plant. Um, there's a photo of me with one. I think that's a photo that Stacy used of me. They're so big that they just like, you know, make the tiny little gynesthesium in the middle look so tiny. And you can see my hand there for scale. These are the largest flowers of any milkweed in Florida by far. So there's no mixing this one up with another species. And these only occur in wet prairies, wet flatwoods, wet savannas. Um, and it definitely is a plant that I think would have good potential in yards and gardens and is becoming a little more available at nurseries, but not commonly available yet. And I can just see many people wanting to grow this simply for those crazy looking beautiful flowers. And you, typically this plant is usually about knee high for me. So about a foot to two feet tall, but occasionally you'll see real tall ones. And that's just genetic variation within the species. There's a picture of me on the left holding one that is coming up to my neck there. Okay, class bean milkweed, Asclepius amplexicollis. And this species is another sandhill, slow growing species with a deep tap root, but it's very big. Um, unlike that prostrate low growing Asclepius humistrata, this one gets fairly large. Some of them are my height. And it has a lot of variation in color and form, as you'll see in these photos here. There's a picture of my friend Erica. We were out on a bike ride and I spotted this big, tall Asclepius inplexicollis in bloom. It's just really beautiful. There's so much variation between the, the color in this species. Look at that one on the left. It was just like almost black. It was so burgundy and you can see the um, the nectar is just dripping off of it. The nectar has pooled up in those hoods and it's just dripping off of it. The one on the right was really stunning too. I saw that one out in the Western Panhandle. And definitely a species that you see a lot of caterpillars on. It's definitely a species that monarchs tend to prefer certain milkweed species. And I, I often see caterpillars on this one. 
Um, but again, it's not, I do see it available, but it's extremely slow growing. I've tried growing it before from plants that um, a grower had, and it is very finicky. A lot of these sandhill species are very resentful about being moved. They don't like it. And so if you can get your hands on some seed um, of the species, it's probably your best bet for growing it. But it is somewhat available and it, it is definitely possible to, um, to acclimate it to your yard. It's just, it does really want dry, sandier soil, although it is a little more tolerant of um, more shade and also a little bit more organic matter in the soil than the sandhill milkweed Asclepius um, humistrata is. Okay, pine land milkweed. This is a species that is becoming more available is somewhat adaptable and really lovely as well and has a lot of good leaf matter for monarchs. It really only occurs in the Western Panhandle, but it, it certainly can be grown, I think, in most of North Florida. And it is also very variable. You can see this, this is the darkest one I've ever seen, that one on the left there. And the one on the right is the tallest one I'd ever seen. They're usually about that height, like a foot tall. There's my friend Scott lo lovingly looking at this beautiful milkweed. And then we have world milkweed, Asclepius verticillata. This is pretty, has a pretty expansive range, this species, across the U.S. really and um, in, in Florida. And it occurs in mostly sandier kind of like, um, sand hills mostly, but it does have some adaptability. I have this one growing in my yard right now. I bought one at Green Isle Gardens and it is doing really well. It bloomed once earlier this spring and it's blooming again right now. It doesn't provide a whole lot of leaf matter for the monarchs. As you can see, it's very needle leaves and the name of the species and the species epithet Verticillata comes from the world leaves and world means that rather than having pairs of leaves, they have two pairs of leaves like all going all around coming from the same node in the stem. And these have very tiny flowers as well. Um, there's me, usually these plants are about a foot tall, but I, again, there's so much genetic variation which within species and I found this one that was almost as tall as me. And you see some variation in the flower shape and form once you start really looking at them. So these two species often get confused. People often find Asclepius verticillata, which is much more common, and think that it is Asclepius virigula. And I've even seen them misidentified in published books before, um, but they have very different habitats. So if you are in a wet prairie or savanna, um, you aren't going to see Asclepius verticillata. And if you are in a sand hill, you aren't going to see Asclepius virigula. So that's one way to differentiate them. But the other way is looking at their hoods. So the hoods on virigula are kind of reflexed and flared out like that. Whereas the hoods on uh, Verticillata tend to be a little more curved in. And red ring milkweed. So this is really one of the few species that grows well in shade. And you can see in the adaptation to that is these larger leaves to, to um, take in as much sunlight as they can because they occur in shadier areas. You can see the range map here on the left. It's pretty much only in North Florida, but I think it could have a slightly expanded range if you wanted to grow it, you know, Central Florida. It um, is very slow growing, unfortunately, and though it is in cultivation and is sometimes available at native plant nurseries, and it's a great choice um, to grow from seed if you can get hand, your hands on seed, but Again, it's slow growing. And the common name comes from that they are very white, pristine white flowers, but they have that red pinkish ring at the base beneath the hoods, between the hoods and the corolla there. So you can see a better look of the ring there. It's a really beautiful species. 
Okay, a few flower milkweed, Asclepias lanceolata. This is pretty common in Florida, and I'm surprised that it's not in cultivation more. It is coming into cultivation and becoming more available, but this is a species that I think is pretty easy to grow, even if you don't have really wet soil. If you have soil with enough organic matter in it and you, you know, don't let the soil get too dried out, these plants are pretty adaptable because you know, even the wet areas in Florida that like wet ditches and roadsides you often see this one on, um, they dry out and sometimes get very dry. So a lot of our species are a little more adaptable than we think they are, but not on the drier scale because, you know, a scrubby sand hill is never going to get very wet, but a ditch might get pretty dry. So you have to, the wet species that the occur, that occur in wetter areas are usually more adaptable. And so those are the ones that are a little more um, useful and adaptable for homes and gardens. This one has a large range across Florida. It's a very tall and kind of spindly species, but and it has these very long leaves. You can see my hand there. And th the plant is so uh, almost unnoticeable that it looks like the flower cluster is just like floating in the air there. And it has a lot of variation in color and form as well. And this species, native species, is often um, confused and misidentified with the invasive tropical milkweed. And so the non-native milkweed that you that is the only milkweed pretty much that is commonly available, and especially in larger stores, Asclepias cursavica, um, it is, you know. It's debatable about the um, the whether it is truly invasive. I consider it invasive, and I think that we will soon eventually get it listed as invasive because it is already known and and recorded and and spreading in so many natural areas, especially in Central and South Florida. And there are a whole lot of other issues that this plant. Um, has brought to the table that are it's causing a lot of problems for monarchs. And I can get into that in a little bit if I have enough time. But tropical milkweed has much wider leaves. Um, they're shorter as well, whereas the Asclepias lanceolata have very long and narrow leaves. But the flowers look pretty similar. But again, the hoods on a lanceolata, they have that kind of flare form, whereas the hoods on the tropical milkweed are kind of like that. Swamp milkweed, this is one of the best species for growing in um, yards and gardens to provide a good amount of leaf matter to replace that non-native tropical milkweed that is pretty much the only one commonly available, unfortunately. But this one grows pretty quickly. It, it gets big and it's really beautiful. The monarchs really love it. They definitely kind of tend to prefer this species. And it gets huge. There's a photo of me with the population I found in Madison County that was like seven feet tall. It gets just really robust. It naturally occurs in swampy, boggy, kind of the edges of mucky, um, like floodplains and such. But it grows in pretty average conditions. This is a at my old house. I planted a population there on the left. And it was kind of slightly clay soil, but it definitely dried out regularly. And that that plant, those plants just thrived. They did really well. The photo on the right is a planting at a holding pond and here in Tallahassee, and they're doing spectacularly. So this plant gets big. I just had to show you the pictures of these stalks. They're massive and it's fast growing. And so that's great to, you know, once a caterpillar strips the leaves of like an Asclepius humistrata, it's not going to leaf out very quickly, but this species, it will come back. So there is some debate about whether the plants that occur in the south here are a different ecotype than the more northern plants. And you can see here the pale green again is where the um, uh, actual counties that the plant is vouchered in. And you can see this large band where it, it doesn't really occur between here and like the Carolinas. There are a few populations, but it's very separated. And um, 
when we first started wanting to plant more native milkweed, this was one of the first species that was available after um, butterfly weed. And uh, those plants and those seeds were almost exclusively from northern populations. And the plants that and, and growing them here has just not, has been proven to not be successful, unfortunately. And that probably has to do with, you know, it being a separate ecotype or maybe subspecies or variety. But regardless, those populations have been separated for so long that it has different requirements than our Florida populations. So if you are planting this one, you really want to make sure that it is from uh, Florida grown plants. So it should be a Florida ecotype. Okay, aquatic milkweed. This is just a real interesting outlier in our native milkweed species, Asclepias perennis. It's another top choice for home gardeners. It's definitely the fastest growing of our native milkweeds. It can get stripped down by monarch caterpillars and then it leaves back out really quickly. It has the longest bloom season of all of our native milkweeds and it blooms profusely, like it just continues to bloom. It has some different ecotypes, different shapes and morphologies between different areas in Florida, I have found. Like the ones in Central and South Florida tend to be more short, whereas the ones here in North Florida, you can see this one came up to my thigh there. And this plant, aquatic milkweed, it occurs in very wet areas, and sometimes it occurs in seasonally flooded areas. It is adapted to, uh, to um, live and to actually depend on seasonal flooding. Um, and it's uh, the only species that do, don't have the white, you know, the white fluffy things that are on milkweed seeds. Those are called comas. And this species doesn't have any because it doesn't rely on air dispersal for the seed dispersal. It actually just relies on moving water beneath it. So that creates a kind of interesting problem in its natural habitat because I have come upon populations where I find monarchs that are mid-size, they've stripped the plant that they're on, and they're not going to be able to get to any other plant and find more food because it's flooded beneath them. So, you know, that's just an interesting fact, but you it can grow really easily in average garden soils. As long as it doesn't get too dried out, it's pretty adaptable to shade or sun. Um, and it's just a really great species. It also, it is one of, probably the only species in Florida that is likely to, we don't know for sure, but it is likely self-fertile and that it can fertilize itself. Um, and so it doesn't require like cross-pollination with a different individual. And so it produces much more seed. And so it's much and it's much easier to find seed for this species because it's so prolific at seeding. And then it's also really easy to grow from cuttings as well. So it just is a species, a native species that is much more conducive to, you know, commercial cultivation. The other thing about this species though, is that it doesn't have a natural senescence period. And when we talk about senescence, that means uh, our native plants are not tropical. So they have a winter period where they die back to the ground and they overwinter as you know, just a root system. And then in the spring, they come back up with a flush of new leaves. This is the only species of our native milkweeds that seems to stay up during the winter. And I've included the dates here of these plants being up above ground. And so it would have been normal to some extent for some caterpillars possibly to overwinter in Florida. But what is happening now with tropical milkweed, the non-native one that is becoming invasive in Florida, that is invasive in Florida, and that, um, uh, you know, is really the only species that is commonly available for, for growers, is that it is a tropical species. So it doesn't have that natural senescence period. It doesn't die back to the ground. And that comes into play with a lot of different things that has vastly affected our monarch populations. And so just for one, just the actual chemical composition when a monarch lands on a tropical milkweed, um, there have been research, there's been research that have been published that that shows that it triggers the monarch taste tropical milkweed and, and is triggered to stop migrating. And so 
that is a problem because we have freezes, not always, but we have freezes in Florida, even in central Florida, we get hard freezes. And so if the monarch doesn't continue migrating and it stays up here thinking that it's in Mexico, they can die over the winter and that can have devastating effects on the populations. But there's also another issue with a parasite, which I will mention later. So butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa var Rolfsii, and we have two different varieties, and that's what the var means. It's short for varieties. And we also have Asclepias tuberosa var tuberosa. And then there's a third undescribed species that is still unnamed in central like Florida and South Florida scrub that um, is being worked on right now to be um, named and identified. This species is really common in the nursery industry because it has such a wide range across the U.S. I was out in New Mexico doing on a bike ride and ran into some up on a mountain up there. But it is not preferred by caterpillars, by the monarchs, because it has no, late, no latex. It's one of the few milkweeds, really the only one, that if you break a leaf off, you don't see that latex sap come out. And it is the least, because of that, it is the least toxic. It has the least amount of cardiac glycosides. And so monarchs, when they're desperate, they definitely will eat this plant, but they don't necessarily prefer it because they want that toxin in order to protect themselves from predators. But as you can see here, this species is highly attractive to adult butterflies of all different types. This is a zebra swallowtail. And there are, you know, because this has such a wide range, again, if you get plants that were from seed, that were grown from seed that occurred in Michigan, and you plant them in Florida, they're probably going to die. So early on, when people were demanding native milkweed from their growers, um, the only seeds really available in bulk were from northern populations, and a lot of people planted these plants and they just died. And so some people thought, oh, this plant doesn't do well here, or it requires like some other type of habitat. Or, But what's really going on is that we need to collect from native populations. Our growers need to have native ecotypes. And so that is really important. And then this species too, also, if it is grown from cuttings, the cuttings are often not perennial. They might grow for a season and then die. Lots of genetic variation in the species. It's really, really um, beautiful. And then here are the differences between the two varieties. This is the most common variety, sandhill butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa var Rolfsii. Um, it's found in very sandy soils. It typically has le wavy leaf margins, as you can see here, here on the right, and the leaves are usually three times as long as wide, so they have pretty wide leaves. And then the leaf bases on this species, that's what I always look for in order to kind of differentiate them. Um, well, you kind of have to look at all of these things, but this is one of the key things, is on this species, they're either truncate, as you can see, there's a um, there are some drawings, illustrations here of those different leaf bases, chordate or hastate. And the leaves are usually widest above the midpoint of the stem. And then Eastern butterfly weed is a little less, is pretty much, le much less common really in Florida. And it's only in North Florida. And it is found in more clay and loamy soils. So like clay hills, and slightly more organic matter in the soil. Um, this species also has leaf bases that are either rounded or cuneate, and the leaf margins are never wavy. And then this is the undescribed species that occurs in scrub in central Florida, and they have very rounded leaf tips. So the very apex of the tip of the leaf, the end of the leaf, is extremely rounded. They're often quite tall rather than low and bushy. And um, there are a few other differences, but those are the main ones. So, okay, we've, we've gone through all the native milkweeds. That was quite a tour. Um, now, where do you get them? How do you acquire native milkweeds to plant in your yard to, to support butterflies? Again, I just wanted to remind you that sandhill species are typically diff more difficult to grow. They're also typically slower growing. 
And if you can find seed for them, that is often your best option for growing them. Although it is possible to transplant them successfully, they just don't tend to be as successful as the other milkweed species. So keep that in mind. If you don't have sandier soil, you might it's likely they might die. So no matter how much you want that milkweed, not, not always the best choice. Okay, so you need to find native plant nurseries that carry milkweed. And so go, you go to this website, plantrealflorida.org. And this is a, a website that is pulled together by the Florida, Associate, Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And on the menu on the left, this is a clip of their website. Um, you'll see retail native plants and you just click on that and then you'll see a map of Florida and it will have all the native plant nurseries. And so you can find the closest one to you and then you find that one on the map and you pick that nursery and then you will see their address. You'll have a phone number, a link to their email or website if they have one. And then some of the nurseries actually provide a plant list of species that they commonly carry. So this is a, a, just a really great resource for gardeners to find plants in general, not just milkweed. But what I would recommend being a nursery manager for more, many years at a native plant nursery is don't count on them to have the plants that are listed on their um, inventory because they change day to day. So if you're going to drive two hours to one of these nurseries, you want to call ahead of time. And if you're looking for a specific plant, call the nursery and ask them. And often you can, you know, get on a list for a species when they start to get in some Asclepias tomentosa, maybe they will keep your name and call you when they come in. But they also need to hear from you in order to know what is in demand and what you want them to grow. And that's really important for people interested in native plants to talk to growers and even not just the native plant nurseries, but other you know, ind um, independently owned nurseries, talking to them and asking about native plants and which species they carry and requesting certain species and also requesting Florida ecotype. Here's another great resource. This is a um, mail order native plant business that is up here in North Florida in Madison County. It's called Mail Order Natives and they actually grow a variety of native milkweed species. They often are sold out and out of stock because they're in so such high demand. But again, you can get on a list sometimes, or if you keep checking their website or get on their email list, they'll send you an update when they restock. They have Asclepias obaveda even, Asclepias variegata. Um, they're a really great resource and they're independently owned up here. And then the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative um, is really the best source for, you know, Florida ecotype seed. And so often the milkweed species are sold out, but they do provide native milkweed species when they can. Right now, we're just in a place where the demand is rising rapidly and the supply cannot fill the demand. So I know it's really frustrating to not be able to get native milkweed when you really want to grow them and support them, but don't get angry with the growers and the, and the retailers because they are trying to provide it. There are a lot of people working really hard to learn how to grow and, and propagate these species in order to provide them for you. And then I just wanted to review, these are all of our species here again. Um, they're, in, I think, in alphabetical order here. We have Asc Asclepias amplexicollis, um, Asclepias conovens, large flower milkweed, Asclepias cinerea, the Carolina milkweed, Asclepias fei, the endemic Florida milkweed, Asclepias curtisii, Curtis's milkweed, endemic again, Asclepias humastrata, the sandhill milkweed, and then Asclepias longifolia, long like sometimes I forget the common names, long leaf milkweed. Yeah. And then uh, Asclepias incarnata, the swamp, pink swamp milkweed, Asclepias lanceolata, few flower milkweed, Asclepias pedicillata, savanna milkweed, Asclepias obafeta, pineland milkweed, Asclepias mishoei, michaux's milkweed, Asclepias perennis, the aquatic milkweed, Asclepias rubra, the purple savanna milkweed or red milkweed. Asclepias tomentosa, the um, velvet leaf milkweed. 
Asclepias variegata, red ring milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly weed, Asclepias verticillata, the world milkweed, and then Asclepias viridiflora, the green comet milkweed, Asclepias viridi, green antelope horn milkweed, and Asclepias virigilla, the southern milkweed. So again, milkweeds are in the family Apocynaceae. They're in the genus Asclepias, 140 species about worldwide, 73 species in the U.S., 21 species native to Florida, and two endemic species in peninsular Florida. And then we're going to talk a little bit about um, Asclepias curasabica uh, and the issues with that, if we have time. If, um, Stacy, you want to pipe in and let me know how I'm doing? I haven't checked. Yeah, we are um, We are at an hour, but um, I see a lot of questions and comments in the chat as well related to this. And it's such an important issue that I would love for you to um, spend some time on it. Okay, yeah. And so, just as a reminder, sorry, as a reminder, if those of you uh, need to jump off because you've only scheduled an hour for this, this will be, uh, this is being recorded and will be sent to you as a link. So if you have to leave, you'll be able to um, catch up on all the information that Lily's about to share. Go ahead, Lily. Okay, so again, this is a non-native species that is uh, native to central Florida that is super easy to grow and propagate. And so it is become, you know, uh, commercial growers find, they find a plant that they can make a lot of money on because it's easy to grow. And then they produce mass quantities of it and really market it. And it was marketed early on as being a savior for the declining milkweed populations. But in reality, you know, it turns out that they're actually hurting rather than helping monarchs. And I know that's really hard to hear. Um, it's an inconvenient truth, unfortunately, because we're seeing that in the science. And so large organizations like the Xerces Society and even you know, the Florida Fish and Wildlife are recommending not to plant this species. And Xerces Society even says it's better to have no milkweed than to have Asclepias curasavica. And especially in Florida, where it has become invasive in Central and South Florida, it is um, forming monocultures that are invading natural areas and pushing out our native plants. And again, remember how we talked about Asclepias perennis not having a natural senescence period where it dies back to the ground. That becomes an issue because of a, um, a protozoan parasite that um, Ophiocystis electroscira, also known as OE, this is a, um, wait, sorry. Oh, I didn't have that slide in there. Okay. This is a um, protozoa that has evolved with monarchs, but because of the tropical milkweed, um, monarchs have evolved with it and have been able to carry a certain load of this parasite on them. But um, just like, you know, different parasites that we have, if we accumulate too much of them, then it can become harmful to our he health and actually kill the host. So um, what happens with OE and tropical milkweed is because these plants don't die back in the fall, infected monarchs that are infected with OE, which are a lot of them, almost most of them, especially in Florida, when they land on any milkweed plant, uh, they shed some of these protozoans onto the leaves. And then when another uninfected butterfly or caterpillar is on that same plant, they can become infected. It, it spreads to other um, monarchs. So the natural, the native milkweeds, except for Perennis, they all die back to the ground in fall. And so they naturally clean themselves of that protozoa and they the protozoa can't accumulate in large quantities on the leaves. But this plant doesn't. And often people even protect it over the winter to prevent it from dying back because they want to keep you know, hosting and um, growing monarch caterpillars. And that protozoa accumulates on the leaves and has created an increase of increase in the population of this protozoa 
in the monarch populations. And that has created an imbalance and is feeding into the decline of the monarch because what happens is um, they, they become unhealthy and die. The more protozoa they accumulate on them, they get sicker and sicker and they can't they cannot migrate. If they don't die from the amount of OE on them, then they are just unable to make it all the way to Mexico during their migration. So even one way of getting around that, we used to recommend that people cut back their Asclepius curasavica rather than um, you know, leaving it up over the winter. And that does help. It keeps the OE from accumulating on the leaves, but it's still feeding into other harmful problems with that are hurting the monarch as a species and that is they're invasive and so they're harming our ecosystems by upsetting the balance in them um, and replacing native milkweeds that our monarchs have evolved to have this relationship with and then again as i mentioned before there's some recent evidence that suggests that, that just the chemical composition of tropical milkweed when a when a butterfly lands on a milkweed, they have receptors in their little feet and they can taste like the chemical composition of the plant. That's how they know they're on a milkweed. And experiencing the composition of this specific species is triggering a disruption in their migration cycle. And so even if, if this plant is in Georgia, they might stay there and not and not continue to migrate or Oklahoma or something. And so it's tricking them essentially. They taste this plant and they think, oh, I guess I'm there. I'm there in Mexico. Um, that's a hypothesis. But we are seeing this correlation that monarchs are not migrating when they encounter this plant. So that is another reason. And the biggest one for me is that it's not native. And that's enough for me in that it's spreading invasively. And because I know how complex our ecosystems are and there's so little that we really know. We really only know the very tip of all of the complex relationships between insects and native plants. And our native insects and native plants have had millennia to co-evolve and depend on each other. And introducing a non-native plant into the mix, especially one that is proliferating and spreading in natural areas, I see them spreading invasively even in North Florida here, um, throws things off balance and can be really harmful. So um, again, this plant is actually hurting and not helping, which is really, um, disappointing. And I wrote a whole article about this problem. If you want to learn more about it, it's on our um, our Florida Native Plant Society's blog. You can just Google tropical milkweed FMPS. And we also should, I think Rose is going to be providing a link to that article. And it has all of the references for the papers that I'm referring to and other um, organizations, articles and research. So you can, you're not just hearing it from me. And then, okay, that that is all. And I just wanted to mention, I am a big fan of Doug Tallamy. Bringing Nature Home was a book that really changed the trajectory of my life. And this quote of his is really important to me. And he said, which animals will make it and which will not? We help make this decision every time we plant or remove something from our yards. And I thought that was a great quote. So <laughs> that is it. I know it's a lot of info to absorb. Thank you, Lily. It's such important info. And I wish we could spend a couple hours on this because I think you could go into a lot more in detail. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I know we're running on time here, but um, there are a couple of questions. And, and for those of you who have questions, I see there's a lot. Um, we can collect those. And um, if Lily is amenable, we can send them to her and maybe get some answers to some of these that we don't have time to address today. But I do have a couple, if you have a couple minutes sure. that um, I'm free, so, yeah. seen a lot of. Um, talking about the OE, does OE persist in milkweed seeds? No. Okay, that's a great answer. Um, really like only where they land and kind of, it's not systemic to the plant. So it's on the surface of the areas they land. And so the seed is within a within the seed pod and it wouldn't have OE on it. Great. 
Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of questions. Well, I have kind of a double question here, but there are a lot of people asking about giant milkweed, the Calotropus gigantea, which we know is not native, but I know that a lot of people are planting it, particularly in South Florida. It's doing quite well and seems to be um, really uh, pervading in the market. Can you speak to that? Any, any issue? I mean, it's not native, so there's the hard line for most of us. I would say it's definitely not as bad as the Sclepius curisavica that we know of. But when we introduced the Sclepius curisavica, we didn't think it was bad either because we didn't know. We didn't know the consequences because it takes time to see those consequences. And so in my opinion, um, the only safe plant to plant is a native plant because any other plant is affecting the complex interactions within our ecosystems. And so I wouldn't recommend planting it. I know it's really beautiful. I grew it before, but um, I just I just can't in good conscience recommend it. And it also we have also seen a lot of research that is showing that the mass rearing of monarch caterpillars at homes are causing issues and possibly harming the species as a whole because we're essentially um we are helping them so much that they're not uh, naturally weeding out the weak individuals and so this genetic pool of the plant of the species is becoming less resilient because there are so many more weak individuals that are surviving because we're kind of helping them. So I know it sounds painful, but some monarch caterpillars are supposed to die in an order for, you know, the species as a whole to persist and be healthy because their genetics don't have what it takes to move on, you know. Um, so the less interference we do, the more that we're just kind of trying to recreate our native ecosystems in our yard and not interfere too much with them, um, we're seeing as that's really important that we we need to not tr try to interfere too much in protecting species, um, in protecting this species in particular and rearing too many caterpillars. I think it's really important as an educational tool and as an engagement and interaction and inviting people into native plants and into being excited about insects and the um, cycles of life and metamorphosis. But I don't think that people who are rearing large quantities of caterpillars every year, we're finding that that is actually harmful. And it's really hard to hear, and I'm sorry to say that, but um, that's what the research is showing. And we just have to follow the research. Absolutely. Um, and there are a couple of people who have pointed out um, twine vine as a, an, an alternative. Um, that's the um, sarcostema. I think it's actually been changed. It might not be sarcostema anymore. Um, I think but, it's sarcostema still. I, I, I'm yeah, not sure. I don't know. I can't, <laughs> I can't keep up with the changes that seem yeah. to happen. So we days. have lots of milkweed vines, which I mean, I'm not sure particularly about Sarcostema, but there's Gonalobus and Madalia as well. They they tend to not prefer them, but they do use them, especially if they started on a milkweed, on a Asclepius, and then you ran out of native milkweed food, you can move them over to a milk vine. They're in the same family and closely related, but they're not in the genus Asclepius, and I obviously didn't have time to go over all of those in <laughs> one, one talk. Yeah, we're focusing just on Asclepius today. But that's a great point. And then I don't know if you want to speak on this or not, but um, we get this question a lot too with regard to the population of monarchs in South Florida and whether or not they're migratory and how that yeah. um, impacts this conversation. Is that something you would address? So I would say that there's a lot of debate about that. Um, I would say that in my opinion, I think we have an unnaturally an unhealthy population of non-migrating monarchs in South Florida. We likely, based on the research I have seen, had populations of non-migrating monarchs, and they were probably supported by Asclepius perennis, the one native species that doesn't die back over the winter. 
but that species would not have occurred in the quantities that Asclepius curasavica now occurs in. And so we're getting an influx of a larger amount of non-migratory population. And then we're getting an influx of this non-native milkweed that is increasing the load of the parasite. And so it's creating a really kind of disastrous and unhealthy situation um, with a non-migrating population, which it probably did originally occur, but not in the quantities that it does now. Great, thank you. Um, well, we are at um, getting close to an hour and a half, so I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, as I said, we can collect the questions that have been um, Put up here and, and see what we can do about getting some answers. If you had a question that wasn't answered, you're also welcome to email us info at flawildflowers.org and we will um, do our best to, to get that answer for you. Um, again, the um, presentation is being recorded, so there's a lot of information given out today. I encourage you all to go back and review it. Um, it'll be on our YouTube channel and our website. We'll be sending out a link to everyone who registered um, with that um, with the recording. <laughs> so you should have that in the next um, 48 hours or so. Um, thank you so much, Lily, for the work that you're doing, um, for the information you provided, and um, just for giving us your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And I would say thank you for, for the work that the Florida Wildflower Foundation is doing. You guys are providing an incredible resource for education, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I mean, same for I mean, conservation work like ours, too. I don't know if everybody knows, but the Florida Wildflower Foundation funds a lot of different conservation projects as well, and including um, an internship in my with my program. So thank you again. Thank you. Yes, no, we are happy to partner with the Florida Native Plant Society and look forward to um, lots more amazing work. Yeah. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, again, if you appreciate our programming, please uh, consider becoming a member, getting the license plate, visit flawildflowers.org to learn more, visit fnps.org to learn more about the Florida Native Plant Society, uh, become a member of that organization too. Um, we, we are a good partner, but we do different things. So it's really important to support us both. And um, anyway, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Lily. Thank you.